It's an honor for me to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Lordi Santa Maria. She's the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning of the Faculty Development and Inclusive Excellence at California Lutheran University. She holds a PhD in bilingual special education rehabilitation and school psychology from the University of Arizona with an emphasis in multicultural multilingual education. Over the last 20 years, Dr. Santa Maria has held a wide variety of diversity, equity, and inclusion related positions in public education. In 2012, Dr. Santa Maria was appointed to the Faculty of Education at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where she was Associate Professor of Educational Leadership promoting diversity. In 2017, she became the Director and Principal Investigator for the Mixteco Indigena Community organizing project in Oxnard, California, where she worked alongside with, for, and on behalf of micro-indigenous community members, studying indigenous healing modalities to address stress, anxiety, and depression. Her multiple peer-reviewed publications, international research awards, and track record of empirical research precede her current appointment at California Lutheran University, where she shares years of experience in leadership, teaching, research, and service in higher education to inform faculty development initiatives in service to a new generation of culturally, linguistically, gender, and ability diverse educators and students. So let's welcome Dr. Santa Maria with a virtual applause. The microphone is yours. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Muchisimas gracias, Roberto. I really appreciate this awesome um, introduction and opportunity to work with all of you. I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm hoping that all of the screen sharing angels are, are with me um, because I always am nervous about screen sharing for good reasons like this one right here <laughs> for my screen. There we go and here we are. Fantastic. So the talk um, today, this is the topic, um, the justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, or JEDI, we'll talk about that in a moment, learning analytics, educational interface. And then I made a subtitle after I thought a lot about this, and that is also known as what is JEDI doing in a nice field like learning analytics? Um, Roberto, I can't see you because of the way I'm screen sharing. Can somebody please just let me know that you can hear and see the screen, hear me and see the screen. Yeah, both. Yeah, Fantastic, both great, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. <clears throat> and so, um, welcome all, bienvenidos de Ndojalito, aloha, palofa lava, malo alele, bula bula tena koto katoa. I welcome you in all the languages that are recognized in my heart, in my work, English, Spanish, Mixteco, Choctaw, Native Hawaiian, Samoan, Tongan, Fijian, and the Maori language um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I've spent um, five years working. Um, I now welcome you and the language of Aotearoa, New Zealand, very along the lines that Roberto welcomed you earlier, and I'm honoring the Chumash land that I worked from um, over in, in California. I'm, I'm actually presenting uh, this talk from Texas, from Dallas right now, but um, I want to share this with you a little bit. Kamihi atukia koto katoa tena koto. Heartfelt greetings and greetings to all of you. Kotene pepeha ki te taha otokufaya. I want to greet you from my maternal lineage today. Ko waka re renge. So the boat that the, my family uses to travel the world is an airplane. Ko sierra morena te maunwa. My mountains are the mountains of Sevilla, España, Seville, Spain, where I was born. Ko rio waldal kivirte awa. My waters are the water of the river of the Waldaquivir in Sevilla. Co Luisiana Criollo, No America, Africa, Chacta, Raoco, Europa, and Louisiana Creole, a blend of North African, North American, African, Native American, and European ancestral lineages. Co Chacta Nation, Oklahoma, Teapu. My tribal descendants is that of the Oklahoma Chacta Nation. Co Marion Faye Harris Callahan. Raoko Alvin Johnson Okumatua. My parents are Marion Faye Callahan Harris and Alvin Johnson Sr. of Morgan City and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
Um, ko Andres Santa Maria Toko Ojotane. My husband is Andres Santa Maria. Ko Kenya Pilar Rao. Ko Andres Julian Akutamariki. Kenya Pilar and Andres Julian are my children. Ko Lori Johnson. Many rivers. <laughs> Santa Maria. Tena koto. Tena koto. Tena koto katoa aho. Um, I've been doing this work for about 20 years. And I come to you in the space of having seen learning communities succeed and fail, right? To do to how they approach this notion of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the names have changed over time. But this is where I'm coming to you from and um, really excited to explore the interface of my work and the work of learning analytics and knowledge. Um, this is kind of what the keynote's gonna look like today. I'm gonna share with you some context talk about some definitions, talk about the rationale, meet you together, meet with you at an interest convergence moment, share some case studies of my research with you. Let's talk about how this work, um, this Jedi LA interface can work toward a higher, greater good, some challenges into opportunities. And I'm gonna actually end with more questions because that's kind of how this work goals. But I want to share with you my relationship to learning analytics because I actually have a relationship um, to learning analytics. My relationship began with, um, it's pretty complex. As a Black African-American, Spanish-born, Spanish-speaking, Indigenous descent woman, I was actually referred in the United States. When we came back to the U.S., I was born in Spain and we came to the U.S. when I was five and I was referred promptly to special education programming. Um, by the second grade, I was in full um, assessment mode. I was exposed to and engaged to learning analytics in these ways. Um, and looking back, I think I must have been an enigma to the teachers that were responsible for teaching me. The early testing, however, analysis and reporting indicated that I fell into the gifted range and I was placed on the exceptional learners independent learning system. Uh, the teachers got their wishes. I was snatched out of the classroom, but I was also taken away from my peers and placed into this gifted and talented enrichment. A lot of this independent programming work, um, and testing and monitoring were absolutely incessant during that time. I remember being encouraged to track and reflect my own progress using this programmed instruction um, components like this SRA uh, kit that you can see here. Um, a lot of fill in the bubble, um, low tech Scantron generated test scores and rankings followed me. Um, I was regularly exposed to the scores. Oh, performing at 11th year, 12th year while in primary school. And I just wonder, was all of this work, were these exercises, um, were these uh, practice um, for my own future? Were these indicators of my future? <clears throat> Over the years, I continued to excel, um, seeking ways to understand analytics that were so present in my education. I eventually studied and became a bilingual special education teacher. I wanted to understand and optimize learning and schooling for the students that teachers assumed wouldn't do well in school just because of the different backgrounds that they came from, like me. So my younger self thought, maybe I'll become a school psychologist, right? Like Dr. Clark. She was the only um, black woman doctor I'd ever met in my life uh, when I'm under the age of 12. Um, but my consciously raced, gendered, classed, and languaged PhD research um, actually sent me toward the paths of intersectionality and social scientific aspects of learning, critical race theory, and educational leadership. And so my research methods of choice moved from quant, quantitative, to, to very qualitative, and that's kind of where, where I am right now. And so this learning analytics have kind of followed me, um, but um, I want to break down how, how learning analytics and its relationships, how it, how, it, how it meets up, how it bumps up against justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in learning analytics. And um, I want to talk about some some definitions because I think understanding this 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 interface this relationship begins with a shared understanding of terminology right and so I'm going to be defining 
justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in education. And the 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 the, um, the, the definitions I'm using come from Public Lands Alliance, originally defined by the Arvana Group. If any of you are interested in in that and the definition, so what is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion? In this context, justice refers to righting wrongs, basically. It means dismantling barriers. Um, it means, um, you know, looking at the isms in society, classism, racism, sexism, et cetera. That's the justice part, righting wrongs. The equity bit refers to allocating resources to ensure everybody has access to the same resources and opportunities. Equity, in this case, is really recognizing recognizing that advantages <clears throat> recognizing that advantages and barriers exist equity is the approach and equality is the outcome yeah and so in terms of diversity diversity is the differences between us race language culture ethnicity gender sexual orientation and class these are based on ways that we experience structural systemic advantages or encounter structural or systemic barriers and opportunities. These are ways to think about diversity in the way that I am thinking about it in this talk. And then finally, inclusion. Inclusion refers to um, fostering a sense of belonging by centering value and amplifying the voices, perspectives, and styles of those who experience more barriers based on their identities. But, Justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion are way more than that. When we we um, we look at other ethnicities, different ages, geography, sexual orientation, social standing, abilities, embracing justice, incorporating equity, considering the reality of diversity, and practicing inclusion. These are values forward ways of thinking and being. I'm practicing all modes of teaching and pedagogical pursuits, including learning analytics. And so why are people talking about, I, I'm a little insulted, I want you to know, I've been doing this for so many years. It's like, why, why so much now? When, why is critical race theory in the paper? And what's all the buzz? I think it's interesting. In your field, what I found is that um, for the purposes in learning analytics, as a purpose of understanding and optimizing learning, and the environments in which they occur to predict student academic access, uh, to predict student academic success, and more specifically, to identify students. Here's where my, my work comes in handy, who are at risk of fight, failing a course or dropping out of their studies. And so we start to see, thank you, Solar Research, for that quote. We start to see how the bumping up, how it starts to begin. We start to see that learning analytics and the ways that it was present in my life and the way that it touches many people's other lives is good. It is inherently good. I don't know. Is it like vitamins? Like education. <laughs> it's the, the right thing to do right now. It's the new status quo. It's the right way to be. Looking at justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion is doing the right thing. It's because there is and there's always been a moral and ethical imperative to do right in teaching and learning, to, so, so to level the playing field, so to speak. And these are mechanism and, mechanisms and constructs that help us get there. So in this way, education in and of itself is progress and is therefore good, right? I'm gonna be asking you a lot of questions today. When it comes to education in the field of learning analytics, the discipline is, open quote, for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs to predict student academic success and identifying those students. As I said, this is the right thing to do, right? So what is our shared why? What is the resonance between my work and your work? And what ways do our interests converge? The justice, equity, diversity, inclusion paradigm versus learning, analytics, and knowledge. How do they fit together and complement toward the higher, greater good? Well, I've been doing some of my, my research and I want you all to know that there are folks in your field who are doing this work. And I'm going to share a little bit of that 
some of the key findings because I'm going to use that to broaden and show you some case studies that link some of my own research so that we can see what this interface looks like. And so in terms of embracing justice and learning analytics and knowledge, folks in your field um, like Aguilar, um, Prince Lou, who I saw is here in the room, hello, Slade, um, Johnson, Williamson, and Kizilsek have been looking at the nexus of big data, digital innovation, and social justice and education, have been looking at beyond justice towards ethics of care. Y'all have been looking at ethics and justice in learning analytics. Y'all have been looking at um, Williamson and Kizilsek in particular have been looking at some learning analytics dashboard work. And they were looking at 45 different papers and they said, you know, what's going on? There's not a lot of a lot of work. We're not doing a lot of work in our field. However, um, we found very few studies directly addressing or mentioning justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. But we did find that when we do look at this, these things in learning analytics, we share sharing software resources is helpful. Conducting cross-border collaborations is helpful. Better incorporating user needs is a good thing and centering considerations of justice and learning analytics dashboard efforts to improve historical inequities is something that we should be doing. So y'all are embracing justice and learning analytics and here and there's some proof that you all are working on dismantling some of these barriers. In terms of incorporating equity in learning analytics and knowledge, um, Holstein and Dorowdy, Francis Brown, Sai and Froda have actually been looking at um, looking at such items as fairness and equity in learning analytics, thinking critically about learning analytics and student outcomes of equity attainment, been talking about empowering learners, um, agency, equity and transparency. And then Wise, Wise and Sarimento and Booth actually have taken a subversive stance in looking at equity. These folks are engaging with issues of power and equity in education and the ways in which they interact with use on data and learning processes, drawing on efforts from multiple fields, interdisciplinary work, um, looking at critical race studies that have a long history of examining the role of data in issues of race, gender, and class. And so I love the findings here, helping us to actually identify tacit assumptions in practice, asking generative questions about design and considering new modes of creation to produce tools. So here we are in learning analytics incorporating right now equity in learning analytics knowledge, recognizing advantages and barriers. So we're doing good, huh? We're doing good. This interface is tight. It's really tight. But it begins to fall apart just a little bit when we look at diversity as being real in learning analytics and knowledge. You're probably saying, well, what does she mean by that? Well, the work that I looked at and that I reviewed makes me wonder, do or does learning analytics transcend diversity? Or is it feeling like it does? Because there's not a lot of direct um, work that actually talks about race, language, culture, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or ways people experience structural and systemic advantages or encounter barriers. I'm seeing a lot more work on looking at learning styles and learning differences. Boston Pardo, Mary I, Philip Smauer, Preston, Wilson, Watson, Thompson. Um, I'm seeing a lot more work um, that makes me wonder if the field of learning analytics is post-racial, post-cultural, post-linguistic. I don't know, but I did find this beautiful study by Marauri and Giannopoulos that talks about, um, I love this, these key findings that talk about the emergence of constructivist collaborative environments. Certainly these are inclusive of diversity, but it's just not named as such, it's not called out. Um, this research also found that providing insightful models um, of, com of complex um, student behavior was a good, a good thing. We come back and we look at practice of inclusion and in learning analytics and knowledge. And, I, and we come back to this promoting sense of belonging, centering value and amplifying voices. I'm seeing a lot about ethics of inclusion in the works by the authors that are listed here. Some of the names are repeated, Francis Brown and Foster, Horsley, Martinez Maldonado, <laughs> Agaspic, Dawson, Jamonic. Inclusive learning environment design is what Brooks and, and Kilsbeck and Dowell talk about. But Parks and Banquets, Barty, Myler, and Peters talked about learning analytics as 
promising ability to target personalized support to profiled at-risk students. They don't say who the at-risk students are, but if I look at demographic record, I'm going to find that the at-risk students in our country, in the United States, anyway, are our students of color, our Black, our African American, our Latinx, are some of our Asian Pacific Islander students. Students who aren't doing well. Um, but but you all are talking about looking at students through mapping large stealth historic student engagement data, attendance, who goes to the library, virtual learning environments, activities. Here's some demographic information and typical student outcomes. So there's this kind of race elusive, a little race evasiveness kind of activity going on in the field, but that's okay because we have to start somewhere. I found rich data, rich findings in justice and equity and diversity and inclusion from you, from your field. And I was really happy to find that because in order to have this premise of this interface, I have to find the connections and you have them and they're strong and they are deep and they are lovely and they are wonderful and they are useful. And so what might this, this um, interface look like? I am proposing a, a deeper, more substantial paradigm shift in learning analytics, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence. I wanna bring justice, equity, diversity, inclusion deeper into learning analytics, but that is going to require movement of thought, of theory, and of practice. What might that look like? And I'm gonna introduce um, some of my own work to you. I know this is small um, in comparison to the other slides, but it needs to be, it's small but mighty because it's showing a continuum a continuum of practice. It's showing a paradigm shift. And it also traces my own um, trajectory. I was trained at the University of Arizona to be a really good empirical researcher. And I was a very good empirical researcher. I am still. But I started out in the framework of researcher as colonizer, where the researched was colonized. It didn't use this language back then, but this is what was happening. Researcher as knower, researcher as teacher, researched as object, subject, the known or the pupil. Remember, this was special ed research. Researcher as redeemer, because we're, we're bringing the answers, right? The researched as the problem. So this is whiteness centered or what I know now as colonizing practices. Since then, my work has moved along this continuum. There was even a point where like some of the studies I found in learning analytics, I was kind of being culturally or color evasive, being fair, being objective. But later on, as during my studies and during my work, and working with different groups of people, moving from quantitative to quantitative, my work became more culturally relevant, more culturally responsive, more culturally sustaining, a lot of co-participatory co research. And so I did see some of the work in your field work moving in this direction. But again, decentering whiteness, moving away, moving into some futurities. At this moment, my work has devolved in a good way into what you heard Roberto describe as research alongside, for, on behalf of. This is co-decolonizing work where I work with different communities of practice and of color that I may not belong to. Um, so that's why it's co-decolonizing work um, in education. If I'm working alongside or with um, African-American communities or women or in groups that I represent, then that's decolonizing research. Native American and American Indian folks that are working on behalf of their own communities, that's called decolonizing work. I'm very troubled when people say things like, we need to decolonize learning analytics, or we need to decolonize our syllabus, or we need to decolonize fill in the blank, because we can't decolonize because people, you have to be long to the group if you're going to be decolonizing. This is one of the premises that I, I, I really believe. We can cope, decolonize, we can work with people, we can work alongside and partner as some of folks in your own field have, have located. But I just, I show you this to say that this is a continuum of, of knowledge. These paradigm shifts are moving and I'm hoping that learning analytics is also moving more along this continuum. And so I now share with you a few case studies that sort of, um, how shall I say, exempl exemplify some of, of what I'm talking about because it may seem, it may seem very um, theoretical. So one of the case studies I'd like to show you first is the Mixteco Indígena work. 
and that is an example of the cross-border collaborations and this constructivist collaborative environment work that Williamson and Kizilsek in your field have looked at and found. Um, and so let's take a look at the Mixteco Indígena work. I'm going to stop share for just a moment and then I'm going to share again just so that I can find that work for you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. yep. Roberto, can you confirm that you can see this? Yep. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. So this this particular this is a presentation within a presentation um, because this is actually sustainable mixteco indígena research methodology where I am working across border, literally cross border, meaning I'll let this one go big for a second, um, with with mixteco indígena women from Oaxaca, Mexico, where we were studying that um, those indigenous healing methodologies that Roberto mentioned in the intro, and in this work there was shared uh, power. There was a uh, lot of, of, of um, a lot of um, transmutation of research. There was even an epistemology that emerged. And this kind of work came from m myself actually stepping back and letting the group, letting the, the group of people that I was working with lead the research. Even the dissemination, the way dissemination was shared was quite different and not the way I was necessarily trained to conduct research. Um, after training this particular team, uh, the team actually said, if you want to work with us, we want to conduct the research ourselves. So can you please teach us the research methods? This is a trilingual event where I am a Spanish speaker, but I don't speak Mixteco, which has many different variantes or variants um, where there's a lot of a lot of a lot of um, interpretation, a lot of translation. But the team told me, can you please teach us We'll do the research. You can't do it. You're not from our community. You don't speak our language. Teach us and we'll do it. So I taught them a master's and a PhD level research methods course. And um, I then therefore had to unlearn uh, my own learning, my very deep empirical training, research training, as I did in Aotearoa, New Zealand with Maori, uh, to adapt Mixtec ways of knowing. The group shifted from focus group interviews. They just obliterated them, We something else happened. I call them authentic conversations where there were women and children and food and music taking place while we were collecting this data. I thought we would be conducting surveys. They scratched those, they became home visits uh, where people were sitting around and chatting and, and, and again, collecting data in that way. Um, and then instead of just reporting the results, we ended up actually learning the, the uh, modality, healing modalities ourselves. I am now a bona fide curandera um, out of Oaxaca. I learned my, my training from Oaxaca. It's very interesting. And the way that we reported our work was also very different um, because the reporting became not just a paper, but actually data um, that was shared with the community by way of video, YouTube video, by way of face to face. And my video is not working. I would love to share it with you, but we're not going to do a triple layer on this, but um, I can make this available to you. But I want you to know what I want to share with you is that the findings were phenomenal. I don't know if they would have been different if I did not turn over this research to the group, but um, these are the, I believe these are stress. This is the indicators for stress before the treatment, which was uh, exposure to these indigenous healing modalities. And then you can see the stress levels went down. And I believe this is anxiety. And you can see that that went down and then um, depression and then that went down. And so this is just an example, even the way that this research is presented, um, it's very different from any other research I've ever done. It's because I actually stood, I actually turned the project over and was more of a facilitator than anything else. And so. That's one of the projects. One example of conducting cross-border collaborations, incorporating user needs, centering considerations, um, 
um, based in giving the power, right? Changing and, and sort of sharing power in those sorts of ways. I mean, it also speaks to inclusion um, and genuine collaboration and partnership that Parks found in, 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 in Associates and their work. And so I'm gonna go back now and um, good to see you all. And I'm going to share my screen again, go back to where I was hopefully and get back to, I hope that you can see back to where we were. Are we back to where we were? Ricardo. Yeah, uh, there, Lori, there's a little bar um, black bar. Uh, can you see it as well as us? Covering the title. Yeah. Is it gone? Yeah, yeah. Ah, thank you. Is it gone? Yeah. Okay. Are you able to see the case studies? Slide? Yeah. Yes or no? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. I'll make sure you can see that. All right. So another example is co decolonizing work. Um, and Roberto told me that some of you have seen the TED talk that I gave. And so I won't, I won't speak too much about the co-decolonization work. However, um, it, it, this is an elaboration on that, a continuum that I showed you. And it's where instead of assuming like learning analytics does and my own research in education does, assuming that we know what people want, it's actually being invited or asked or directly Im implied to do the work for for a group of folks um, that may not be doing the, this work. For me, a lot of this work took place in Aotearoa, New Zealand with Maori and Pacifica um, groups from different islands, also um, in, the, in the US and, and um, also obviously with the Mixteco. But it's about community engagement um, behalf alongside and service to, to benefit other efforts, right? It requires us to act in the capacity of altruistic service with no need for reciprocity. It's just we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. As I shared earlier, it does require humility, detachment from ego, and unlearning or new learning. So the, we have to give up something um, as, as, as practitioners um, and working in these fields that are objective. We have to give up something in order to actually fully engage some of this kind of work. And finally, my third, um, third aspect of um, case study is applied critical leadership. And this work I did mostly, I'm in the US with black, African American, um, Native American, um, AP, API, Asian Pacific Islander, and the LGBTQ plus community, um, looking at ways that people lead out of their identity. But in this work, what I think we can learn in this interface is that this work is about emancipatory practice of choosing to address issues and challenges using a critical race perspective to enact context specific change in response to hearing these words again, over and over again, power, domination, access, and achievement imbalances. Why? To result in improvement for who? Not just for these underserved groups, but for the greater good. We're talking about work to counter stereotypical behavior responses. And so funny because sometimes I'm finding that there are patterns um, in machine learning, for example, that picks up patterns. I'll talk about that in a second, but countering stereotypical behaviors, engaging and facilitating critical thought, courageous dialogue, like what I hope we get to engage later, consensus and decision-making, deferring to different languages and different cultures, um, I I, before I did this talk, we were preparing. I said, is this going to be available in multiple languages for multiple language access? So asking those kinds of questions so we can have increased and a more, more appropriate access, right? Practicing inclusivity, cultural responsivity, culturally sustaining practice, practices. So all voices are heard and shared for a larger number of people. And so this is the kind of work that I've been engaging for, for many, many years. And this kind of work reminds us that we can do better. Education can do better. Your field can do better. Many fields can do better. Fields that are helping. We're in the helping industries, right? How do we do this? We can confront unconscious bias and we can ask the right questions. We can ask the right 
questions. Well, there are some ethics of data analytics, some little issues that I know that you all are aware of because this comes right out of your work. Um, there's a public and professional debate about the ethics of big data and AI, including privacy, right? Including the problem of the opaque black box algorithms, the risk of training machine learning classifiers on biased data sets and the dangers of incorrectly predicting someone's behavior. I saw this piece this morning on the plane in Entrepreneur Magazine about this AI content writing model called the GPT-3 that shows bias when it was tailoring learning for children. I mean, machines aren't perfect. People program machines. Machine learning is gonna show bias. So how do we get in there? And how do we clear out some of these things? These concerns are just as relevant in education. So the ethics of educational data, analytics and AI are front and center. I know in your own work and is a very active stream in what the work that you're doing in your publications and in some of the researchers um, in your field that I, I, hi I, I highlighted earlier. But then we come to some of these really other pressing questions, right? Like who benefits from predictive and, pres and um, prescriptive analytics? Like we benefit because we got these new tools that we can study and teaching and learning and we're at a conference learning about more, right? Um, and data infrastructures are and data captures, all these things, these things can work to close the feedback loop for learners. Um, they can offer more timely, precise, and actionable feedback. These are helpful things, right? But what does that look like? And how do we know if that it's meaningful to students? These are some of the directions I think we're headed. And then lastly, um, educators, instructional designers, and institutional leaders are gaining new insights once the learning process is persistent and it's visible, but to what end? To what end? We got to go back to the back to the kids, back to the learners, back to the individuals who are learning. Looking at predictive analytics to understand the future. Looking at historical data, but from whose perspective? From whose perspective is the historical data being gleaned? We're looking at patterns. We're looking at algorithms to capture relationships and trends. And it's just, but it's sort of like. Is it really objective? Is it clean? Is it, is it, I don't know. We have to confront uh, unconscious bias. Do unconscious biases creep in there? What are some other questions that we can look at and that we can ask ourselves? Who decides what learning analytics get created and implemented when there are groups of people in the world who don't even know that learning analytics exists? And then I back that question up with the other question that's right below. This is a crazy one. What groups and individuals are impacted by use of learning analytics and in what ways? Like who's not touched by learning analytics right now? Thank you, TikTok. Thank you, Insta. Thank you, um, Metaverse. Everybody's being touched by, by anal learning analytics. So are people aware of how much they are being impacted by these different tools? What or whose value systems are embedded within learning analytics? Is it possible for learning analytics to transcend race? Is it possible to transcend culture? Is it possible to transcend language, bias, hate? Is it possible to transcend discrimination? I don't know. I don't know why we might approach learning analytics as if human beings are not the actors who implement and live out the implications connected to the field. I'm not sure why we act as if it is objective, like an extension of machine learning, inherently fair, because there's no discernment of, per of persons. I don't know. You can put education in the place of learning analytics for all of these questions, because we have the same kinds of issues and questions that come up in education. And then I look at these questions and I pose these questions to you. What opportunities do learning analytics offer to drive positive social change? In what ways can we prevent learning analytics from perpetuating problematic systems and practices? 
The real question is, do or in what ways do learning analytics perpetuate problematic systems or practices? And the questions that I just posed to you, I actually extended them from the, your own questions that you used to design this conference. So we're all working together for the higher, greater good and understanding that justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion and learning analytics can work in unison is integral to moving forward in education. And so the bottom line that I wanna leave with you as I wrap this up is there is a moral and ethical imperative to the integration of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into learning analytics knowledge research and practice. Learning analytics research has noted the dearth of and the value and a justice, equity, diversity, conclusion approach. LA, AI, and machine learning have some ethical challenges that require attention. Learning analytics does not transcend race, ethnicity, culture, geography, difference. It does not transcend diversity. There is a way forward, however, that includes co-learning, like what we're doing right here in this interdisciplinary opportunity that I'm really grateful for and I'm just honored to be a part of. Unlearning is what I demonstrated that I had to do for some of my own work and relinquishing some control to share some of the, the, the ways forward in all of this. The justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, learning, analytics, knowledge interface are more than buzzwords. Practicing Jedi can drive learning analytics knowledge upward, forward, and in my opinion, into a brighter, more appropriate and sustaining future. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope that was inspiring. I hope I pushed you a little bit, um, maybe felt a little uncomfortable in some, some ways, but I wanna connect with you now and I, I look forward to doing so now and, and later. So I'm gonna stop, share and see what we've got going here. Much, Lori. Um, thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Uh, we have um, now the Q and A session. Just for everyone to be aware, we are going to have an extended Q and A session. We still have fifteen minutes within this slot, but after that, mm -hmm. we don't have a break before other parallel sessions. So, if you want to remain in the room for the extended uh, Q and A session, then you just need to stay here. Um, otherwise, in around 15 minutes, maybe you want to, to check what's in the program because there are other things that are going to kick start um, in, in 15 minutes, as I was saying, and they are in different Zoom rooms. Um, also, the, uh, there's a panel in the same room in 45 minutes. So you want to come to the panel, you can come back to this um, or stay to the Zoom room. Okay, and we already have... Um, a few questions. Again, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can do it via the Booba link. You can copy this link again. And please know there will probably be no answers, just discussion. <laughs> also, I'm just going to paste it and share again. So let's go with the first question. There is um, okay. There is one question here from Alejandra Martinez Monez. Thank you for this challenging talk. And the question is: In which ways these perspectives you have shared with us are similar or different from action research? Um, I've got a couple. Let's see. Okay. Uh, this is very similar to action research. The paradigm that I showed you, Alejandra, um, that had the blue and white spirals, there was a participatory action research actually um, cited there. So the work that I do is similar to participatory action research, um, but it goes a little bit further um, when you actually turn the research over, the research questions are being generated by the community and the research is actually done um, kind of 
on behalf of the community. So it's, it is on the same the wavelength of, of um, the research that you're citing and suggesting, but it's just going just a little bit deeper, a little bit further, and the researcher is stepping back a little bit more than, than, than they would in a regular um, participatory research paradigm. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Anolis Mavrikis. Thank you for your very inspiring talk. You mentioned bias a few times. We know both humans and algorithms face Jedi issues. If you had to guess from all the approaches you mentioned in the learn analytics, where would you put emphasis if your goal was to support humans, for example, teachers, to overcome their own biases to help them practice Jedi? That's a great question. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first name. Manriquez, I heard part of the name, yeah? Man Manolis. Uh, Manolis, hello, thank you so much. Um, I think that where we fall short, I, I, I'm on, I'm, my bias is toward humans, sorry. I'm warm and fuzzy and grounded. Um, we need training, just like machines. Humans need training. We need to unlearn. Some people don't even know that they have biases. Some people don't know that their biases are unconscious. So just bringing that, even talking about unconscious bias in a format like this one is really important because it makes you question, do I, do I have unconscious bias? Let me, let me Google that. What is she talking about? You know, what is, how does that, what is, how does that, how does that impact my life? as a human being. And so being very, very mindful and being very deliberate in education and, and training more people around un unconscious bias is going to move into the work that we do in learning analytics. Because like I said in my talk, people are the ones who are programming machines. Machines don't program themselves. So it has to start with the human being. I mean, I know eventually we're gonna get to some AI where machines are making themselves. In fact, that machine that I talked about um, that I mentioned earlier is writing code, which I read that and I was just like, I dropped, I dropped what I was reading. I don't want to talk about machines writing code. That freaks me out a little bit, but you know, that's just me. But training people is going to trickle into what we do with our machines. That is what I believe. So people first. Lori, um, the next uh, comment and question from Shamia Karumbaya. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Santa Maria. We sometimes approach equity through increasing representation in data. In some cases, this means collecting more data from underrepresented communities like indigenous people. Could you complicate this approach and tell us if it looks the same from an indigenous perspective? Hi, Shamia. Thank you for your question. I'm not really sure I'm, I can answer that question the way that you're asking the question, um, but I will tell you this, finding Indigenous people to participate in research <laughs> uh, is a challenge. Uh, I know people from different Indigenous groups uh, across the, wor the world who may not, it's going to be hard to get that data. Just, it's just difficult, that, and that's a challenge. And I'm not saying that it's a good challenge or, or that it's a bad challenge. I just, I, I, commend, I commend folks that are trying to use the rep notion of representation and, or, and to bring equity into the work. Um, but I think there has to be a conversation before that about how can we get more participation of underrepresented groups um, in, into, the, into the work so we can better inform the work. Does that make sense? I hate to answer your question with a question, but that's where my mind is going when I hear the question that was posed. Thank you, Lori. We have another question from Marcel Schmitz. Thank you for your inspiring speech. I was wondering, do you now recognize where you are and where in your own personal journey into your field of research? How do we, as learn analytics researchers, recognize where we are or where our efforts in our institutions on learn analytics are? Thank you, Arshel Smith, for that question. I'm just going for, from my 
my trained ear for my learning analytics childhood with Plonix, trying to mimic your names. But um, you know what? It is an individualized journey. Um, I used to say when I taught research methods at the University of Arizona, at University of Auckland as well, me, research is me search. I would guess that every single person whose research I quoted from your field is on a journey that causes them to research these uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, aspects. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, it, it's your journey to have, your journey to take. Um, and you make a decision whether this matters to you. Some people, this talk doesn't matter to them. It's not relevant. It's like, why are we having this discussion anyway? This has nothing to do with our field, but actually we're all human beings and we're all diverse. So this has everything to do with all of our field, with all of us, right? So it's just a matter of making a decision as to how you want to, to reckon with where you are. It is a continuum. People are writing a lot and reading a lot of is being published about decentering whiteness and looking away from the white male gaze as being, you know, the, the paternal. I mean, there's so much feminist um, epistemologies. There's a lot of work. You just have to find where you are and where you're comfortable in your journey and how much you want to push yourself and how much you want to push your field and how much you want to push in your research. It certainly is a choice. A lot of what I write has the word choice in it, choosing change, choice, because it's an individual decision as to whether or not you want to push in that field. For some of us who are coming from underrepresented, historically underrepresented or minoritized groups, it's very important for us to look at these things. Um, but we need allies. Do you hear me? This is a call for allies. We need allies who may not come from um, from underrepresented groups to, to join us and, and to work with us in this, in this really important important work that impacts all of us. When, 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 there's, when there are inequities, all of us are impacted and all of us are underserved. So I hope that answers that question. Lori, there is another question from Simon Buckingham. Do you have thoughts on whether our models of learners should be colorblind? We don't care about your, for example, we don't care about your background. We care only about what you do when you arrive at uni or whether this is virtue signaling a form of willful blindness to ongoing inequities in the conditions under which different students live and work. That was a complex question for me. Um, it, it was your talk, the question has to do with models of learners and color blindness is what I'm getting from this mm -hmm. and looking at characteristics of learners versus um, actual learning characteristics or learning differences as opposed to markers um, like diversity. Is that pretty much kind of captures the question? Um, I think there's value in both. I don't think that one should be separate from the other. I don't think we should only look at race, ethnicity, language, and culture. And, and, and then o or only look at models of learners or look at, at not looking at um, just looking at learners characteristics, but both because you're going to find something in there. And, and you, I don't believe that we can be colorblind. I think that there are some really important things that we can learn by looking at trends, at what kinds of characteristics um, certain learners have based on their different inequities. I'm reading this question, this question on colorblindness. I don't know. I probably shouldn't be reading this. <laughs> oh, okay. This question on color. Somebody is sending something through. Sorry. I don't want to. I don't want to take too much time. But anyway, um, I hope I answered that question. I probably didn't answer it very well, and I apologize. But definitely, this is something worth looking at. But I was very interested that so many people in your field did talk about learning differences and characters, characteristics, but they didn't really talk about, I think it's an effort to be objective and it's an effort to be democratic, but I think that it can go, unconscious biases can come through that still. That's just my opinion. I could be, I'm, I, I'm willing to say that. Thank you. We have another question by Marcel Smith. Um, I think we try to be mindful of race, culture, age, and equality while using learning analytics. 
On the other hand, learn analytics often is used to distinguish groups of students. For example, students at risk, excellent students, students that learn with the strategy A or B. How can we not fall in the trap of forgetting the underrepresented students in our learn analytics loop? Oh, thank you, Marshall Smith, for that question. Um, I'm going to say the bad, big bad words, critical race theory. Please don't come get me. Um, putting race first, race, thinking about racism, think, thinking about difference first, thinking about diversity first, thinking about it in the forefront when you're looking at predictive analytics is really important. Um, not, not leaving that off the table, not leaving that out of the conversation. Do you know what I mean? Inviting talk about those, those physical markers while you are doing your predictive analytics. Is it true? Do the predictive analytics tell the truth uh, about people? You know, I just think that exiting these terms and these topics out of the conversation and out of the analysis is not the way toward being fair because unconscious biases are going to leak in. I don't know how your field is going to do this, how they're going to weave it in, because it didn't start that way. Remember, we we're talking about decentering whiteness. If you're working around objectivity and there's this is the black and white and there's a right and wrong and there's a one plus one is two, you're actually, that's the default. What is the default? Let me ask you this. What is the default? When you're looking at diversity, things become very complex and they become very messy. And so it becomes very complicated. So I'm asking you to invite complexity. I'm asking you to invite messiness. I'm asking you to invite more different lenses and layers into your into the work. I, I think I feel convicted with that statement. Thank you. We have another question by uh, Christos Simis. Thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Working on ethical questions from a decolonial perspective myself, I often encounter defensive responses to this perspective. Do you have any tips on how to bypass such resistance? Two words, interest convergence. I talked about it a little bit in my talk today. Um, when you're doing decolonial work and you're working with ethical, you need to find out what are something that we can all agree on. You will find something that you can agree on when you're partnering and when you're collaborating with people. You do not have to lose. You can find something. Interest convergence is huge. Interest convergence comes out of the critical race theory canon. Um, you can read about Gloria Latson Billings. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody else. I will point you to Gloria Latson Billings first and foremost and look for interest interest convergence and you will find some peace around your work. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. I see lots of thanks and affirmations. I'm really so honored and so pleased and so grateful um, to be a part of this, this talk. And I'm really loving the direction that your field is going in. And I just appreciate the consideration um, looking at systemic inequities and power structures. You guys are on it. <laughs> Very provocative. So I just get to sit here and other people are going to come through. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Very thank much. you. If you have to go, if you have to go, thank you so much. You guys go hard, go well in the work. Well done.